Pia Cristina Kuru was born in the village of Isakairo on August 13, 1974. It is a tiny village located in Ostrobothnia's beautiful area. Isakairo is home to about 4,500 people and prides itself on being a pleasant, family-friendly sanctuary. It is an agricultural village, and the town is bisected by the Chiron Joki River. Pia loved her time in Isakairo and made many friends there. As was the case with the majority of young people at the time, the throng made their way between the villages of Isakairo, Shainayoki, and Nermo. Everyone hitchhiked, it was the most convenient mode of transportation. The distances between towns were often about 25 miles or 40 kilometers, and finding a ride was seldom a problem. On October 3, 1991, Pia and her elder sister went to a restaurant in Nermo to meet some friends. Pia was underage, but her sister persuaded the server to give her a medium-strength beer due to her approaching 18th birthday. Pia was gregarious and candid, a straight shooter with a razor-sharp tongue. Pia left the restaurant around 11 p.m., getting a ride into Shane Aoki with an acquaintance. She stayed there for an hour before calling it a night. She was scheduled to return home with another buddy, but the companion had vanished. As a result, Pia asked another partygoer who was departing if they might give her a ride to Itika Junction. They agreed since Pia said that she would be able to get herself home from there. Around midnight, she was left off at the intersection, never to be seen alive again. Pia's corpse was found in Vassar Bay, about 50 miles, or 80 kilometers, from where she was last seen. The route follows the trail beside the Chiron Joki River for the most part. Police needed to estimate how far a corpse might float in the river in two days, the time it took to locate Pia's body. Police scoured the riverbanks for clues as to where Pia was dragged into the water. They were on the lookout for any hints that could help, drag marks, tire tracks, basically anything telltale. The search area was vast, and it was critical to limit it down before critical evidence was lost to the weather. Divers from the police department went out to conduct a battery of tests. They leapt off a bridge on way to Vassar Bay and floated downstream with the river to see how far they could go. They performed the same thing from Vassar's Bod Strand and Pier as well as from other locations on the beach, including jumping in from adjacent bridges. Finally, they determined that Pia's corpse was too far out to have drifted there from Weeping Junction. She must have been driven to the pier and either dumped into the ocean or carried out to sea in a boat from there. However, this was just their strongest working hypothesis, since there was no evidence of Pia's presence at the pier. After a few weeks, authorities were still without a crime scene. They were without a suspect. They recognized that they would need assistance from the public and were forthright with the media about any leads discovered. Public signs were placed around the city, all pleading for information regarding Pia's last hours on earth. They needed to find out who gave her the ride since she was hitchhiking. Police attempted to reassure the public by emphasizing that the guy who picked Pia up was not definitely her assassin. However, they may possess critical knowledge. Police got many tips and investigated each and every one. Weeping Junction was under continuous observation, on the lookout for individuals in unusual cars behaving strangely. Despite suggestions, nobody saw Pia in the region between her last sighting alive and the sea where her corpse was discovered. Due of the prevalence of hitchhiking, the authorities believed the person who picked Pia up was a local resident. The only thing authorities could do was examine the evidence left on Pia's body and clothing more closely. She was wearing light blue trousers, a white shirt, and a bra when her corpse was found. Her bra had been repositioned such that it no longer covered her breasts. She wore neither pantyhose or socks and was barefoot. The high heel shoes she wore out on her final night were gone, and the culprit was hoped to have retained them. Additionally, they had been unable to find her wallet or keys. This kind of evidence may be used to connect a random murderer to his victim. In the early 1990s, DNA was still a relatively new science in Finland, and so the primary emphasis in the Pia Kuru case remained on the garment fibers and other evidence discovered during the autopsy. Microscopic examination of Pia's clothing was conducted to see whether any components from the murder scene were discovered. Foreign fibers were ultimately discovered on both her clothing and skin. Samples were submitted to the Technical Investigations Group to assess whether there was any evidence linking Pia's corpse to a particular place or crime scene. However, it would not provide immediate effects. Indeed, testing took three years to complete. We'll discuss these findings in more detail later in the sequence of events. Another odd finding was the presence of tiny metal balls with a diameter of approximately 1 mm on Pia's clothes. This is something that one could find at a workshop. When sparks escape from the metal during welding, they create tiny particles that resemble metal balls. Additionally, blue paint chips were discovered on Pia's clothing, corroborating the idea that the murderer worked in a workshop. 
Another possibility was that these particles got into touch with Pia during her body's boat transfer. Due to the fact that Pia was discovered naked, authorities suspected an indecent motivation and questioned indecent assaulters in the nearby villages of Shainayoki, Nermo, Isakairo, and Vassar. Additionally, investigators examined their homes, inspecting their vehicles and outfits, constantly on the lookout for metal balls, blue paint chips, or an out-of-place pair of high heel shoes. However, nothing was discovered. Certain indecent assaulters have compelling defenses. Others did not possess a vehicle at all. Nobody seemed to be a likely suspect. This seemed to be another dead end. However, the investigators were not about to give up. They interviewed residents who lived near the sea or in close proximity to the Bod Strand and Pier. The area's boats were examined and photographed, and forensic samples were taken. Despite this exhaustive investigation, there was no proof that Pia Kuro was ever aboard any of the vessels. Pia vanished just before winter, and when spring approached, they returned to all of the boat sheds in the surrounding region in search of records of individuals who had leased boats in the days before or after Pia's abduction. Background checks were conducted on anybody who had a hunting and fishing license or who had leased a boat in the preceding months. Some witnesses recalled a vehicle going to the water's edge one late night in fall, but could not provide definite details. According to one Vassar resident, the car made a unique sound that he would recognize if he heard it again. It was a large vehicle with a deep, rumbling noise, most likely a diesel engine. There wasn't much more to it, people just remembered the vehicle, since it was the only odd event that occurred at the time. Police honed down on an indecent assaulter who lived in the neighborhood and drove a van. They were, however, unable to identify anybody who matched the description. Because there were no strong suspects or particular individuals identified in the inquiry, and because forensic testing appeared to take forever, authorities got a lot of negative publicity around that time. Then, in the autumn of 1994, police got information about another young lady who had gone missing from the Shainayoki region. On the 11th of October, 20-year-old Pia Marianne Toily was reported missing by her family. She had not been in touch with anybody in over a week. She was last seen in Shainayoki on Friday, the 30th of September. It grabbed investigators' notice because the missing lady had the same name as their unsolved murder victim, but at the time, they believed that this information was a simple coincidence. As the case developed, however, there were many more parallels that sent shivers down the spines of even the most seasoned investigators. Missing person, Pia Toily was a bright, athletic blonde with blue eyes. She had just returned to Finland, after spending the summer in Italy where she worked as an au pair. Pia was scheduled to travel back to Italy to see a lover she had met while she was there, but the family did not believe she had left. Her passport was still at home, as well as all the money she had accumulated for her vacation. Her bank account had likewise not been affected. Pia was last spotted restaurant hopping in the town of Shainayoki. The last location where she was seen was a famous nightclub called Wall Street. As was the norm, when Pia was ready to go home, she planned to catch a ride. The janitor at Wall Street informed police that he observed a young lady who looked like Pia get into an American-type vehicle, perhaps a Chevrolet or similar. Other than that, investigators had no other clues. Whether it was really Pia who got inside the vehicle was also not 100% clear. Police could not ignore that the hint of a vehicle also came up in the Pia Kuru case. From the outset, foul activity was suspected with respect to the Pia Tiley case. One headline read. Disappearance of lady indicates to a crime but who would have taken her? Police reopened the investigation into every indecent assaulter residing in the wider Shainayoki region. They could also not overlook the possibility that the perpetrator might have been from further away, someone who traveled through the region periodically, so they expanded the search to the neighboring areas too. Investigators were keen to acquire more skills to aid in their inquiry. Three FBI agents visited Finland to train police officers in the art of criminal profiling. Previously, different instances of violent assault were investigated independently, as standalone cases. However, in this case, in light of Pia Kuru's 1991 death, authorities suspected a connection to Pia Tiley's abduction. They expanded their search to include all offenses involving intercourse, recorded in the region between 1989 and 1994. They discovered 14 reports that seemed to be identical. A 26-year-old guy named Harry Erki Mikkel Lepinen was one individual whose name appeared several times. He shared an apartment with his girlfriend. Since 1990, the pair had been together. The fact that Lepinen worked as a welder at his father's warehouse aroused detectives' curiosity. Lepinen was apprehended by police from his residence in Shainayoki and taken to the police station for interrogation. They interrogated him about the 14 instances that shared characteristics. 
He maintained his innocence in all of the offenses. If authorities wanted to prosecute him with any of the 14 alleged indecent assaults, they would have to gather evidence against him, since he was not cooperating. To everyone's astonishment, however, Lebanon readily confessed to two more instances of attempted indecent assault that had gone unreported to the police. The first event occurred in 1989, followed by the second in 1994. Additionally, he said that he was alone on the night Pia Kuru vanished three years before and had no alibi to attest for his presence. When detectives dug into Lebanon's history, they discovered that this was not the case. On October 1, 1991, the night Pia Kuru went missing, Lebanon was pulled over by the highway patrol and fined for speeding. He was driving a Mazda 323 that night, the same vehicle he was driving in 1994. He maintained his narrative when faced with the facts. He informed police that he spent the remainder of the night driving alone, but just in the Isakaira region, not in Shainaoki or Itaka. However, he never encountered Pia Kuru. He said that he knew Pia Kuru and had already given her rides before her disappearance. After three days, investigators discovered they lacked strong evidence against Lebanon and were forced to release the only suspect. Nonetheless, authorities were able to seize his car for forensic examination. Surprisingly, Lebanon confessed that he had never washed his vehicle, which meant it had not been cleaned since 1991. If Pia Kuru was ever in his vehicle, authorities had a possibility of finding what they were searching for. They discovered that Lebanon had replaced his car's exhaust four years before and that it was very loud. Indeed, he had been pulled over on Lottie Road by a police car and warned about the noise. Could this be the vehicle heard near the river in the autumn of 1991, as witnesses claimed? Forensic experts began an exhaustive examination of Lebanon's Mazda. The fibers discovered on Pia Kuru's neck, as well as on the inside and outside of her jacket, pants, and bra, matched those found on the upholstery of the front seat of the vehicle. Numerous tiny metal balls, similar to those discovered on Pia, were discovered throughout Lebanon's trunk. Then they discovered a blue car jack in the Mazda's trunk. The rubber seal on Lebanon's car's trunk had come loose, and the jack was employed to properly shut it. The jack's blue paint matched the composition and color of the blue paint chips discovered on Pia's corpse. In a reconstruction, experts tested if a young girl comparable in size to Pia could fit in the trunk, which she did. Additionally, the reconstruction explained the 4-inch, or 11-centimeter, beam-like depression discovered on the victim's left buttock. It was an identical replica of a component of the vehicle jack. Additionally, there was more. Pia Kuru's jacket was soiled with oil splatters. Technicians confirmed that the oil was identical to that which Lebanon was known to buy for heating his flat. According to witnesses, he always carried the big canisters of oil in the trunk of his vehicle. A scrap of fabric was discovered under the driver's seat. When it was tested and shown that it might have been utilized to keep victims in a grip, it had a distinctive double knot that matched the markings seen on Pia Kuru's neck. The police were certain that Harry Lebanon was responsible for Pia Kuru's murder. However, there was no trace of Pia Toily. That is, until her purse was discovered under the suspension bridge at Haikola. CCTV video from Wall Street Nightclub revealed that Pia was carrying the handbag on the night she went missing. Two visitors made a gruesome discovery in the early spring of 1995 at their waterside holiday home on the Herva Jarvi Reservoir in Nermo. It was Pia Toily's half-naked, decaying body. The six-month search was concluded, and the case of the missing individual was deemed a murder. Pia Toily was discovered partly clothed. She was still wearing a bra, but much with Pia Kuru, it was pushed up to reveal her breasts. Her coat and purse were gone from the last time she was spotted. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, determining the cause of death was challenging. As with Pia Kuru, Pia Toily's lungs were dry, indicating she did not drown. A tiny amount of semen was discovered within her, suggesting that she had been indecently abused before to her death. She also had tiny metal balls on her skin and clothing, identical to those discovered at Lebanon's job. Within her purse, which was discovered months later, were fibers that matched those found in Lebanon's vehicle. It was a marvel that the evidence survived after being submerged for an extended period of time. Additionally, it was intriguing because the purse surfaced more than 6 miles, 10 kilometers, distant from the location of Pia's corpse. It was, however, just across the street from Lebanon's flat. This bolstered the idea that he tossed it over the bridge on his way home after disposing of her corpse. Lebanon was apprehended by police on April 15, 1995. He denied picking Pia Kuru up in 1991 and said that he was not responsible for her death. He also denied any participation in Pia Toily's murder during an interview. The police were sure that they had apprehended their suspect. 
they were able to create a profile by chatting with local teenagers in the region. Although many people knew Lepinen, he was always seen as an outsider. He was notorious for taking lengthy night drives after his live-in partner had gone to sleep. Several witnesses reported seeing him in the parking lots of dance clubs, he seldom entered. He liked to loiter in his vehicle and converse with strangers. Regardless of the strong forensic evidence against him, detectives needed to ensure his conviction in court. They capitalized on the time after his arrest to construct a case against him. Investigators felt that examining the two Pia's cases concurrently would assist to strengthen the case. The parallels between Pia Kuru's and Pia Toili's killings were obvious. While Pia is a fairly common given name in Finland, there were other characteristics that connected the victims. To begin, both individuals vanished on a Friday in late September or early October. They were last spotted out with pals in Shanaoki, at a restaurant or club. Additionally, they were both born in 1974. Both of their corpses were discovered in bodies of water. However, to add to the strangeness, police discovered yet another young lady named Pia, spelled slightly differently from the previous two Pias, who vanished in 1988. Pia Irmala Kainkar fit like a hand and a twisted glove into this already strange design. She vanished on a Friday night in the first week of October. She was born in 1974, like Pia Kuru and Pia Toili, but was younger than the other two victims at the time of her abduction. However, consider this, each of the disappearances occurred three years apart. Three Pias, three years apart, each with a victim three years older than the previous victim. Pia Ristikainkar was 14 years old, Pia Kuru was 17, and Pia Toili was 20. Police were concerned that there was a lot more to this case than they first believed. Perhaps the answers lie in the unresolved case of Pia Ristikainkar's disappearance. They conducted a second investigation into the circumstances surrounding her disappearance in the hope of uncovering more evidence. Pia Ristikainkar was born in Pekio, a town in southern Finland. She attended school in the neighboring city of Turku and traveled there daily by bus. Pia shared an apartment with her father and two younger brothers. Her parents had divorced a few years before due to her mother's alcoholism, which contradicted their Jehovah's Witness beliefs. Pia assisted her father by watching her younger siblings while he was away. On Friday, October 7, Pia departed Turku at about 3.30 p.m. and returned almost an hour later. She postponed plans with her friends after promising her father, Heiki, that she would care after her three-year-old brother, Kalia. That evening, around 8 p.m., her father returned home. Heiki left Pia and her 14-year-old brother Tio in the living room to go to the basement sauna, which is when Pia and Tio got into an argument over the TV remote, at which point Pia departed. She said to Tio that she was on her way to her friend Tina's home in the neighboring town of Paimio, but she never arrived. Heiki spent the whole weekend searching for his daughter. She had never fled home before, and the altercation with her brother was not very severe. It was more like to a younger brother who was irritated by his adolescent sister. He was certain she would not have abandoned her family for that reason. She was just too dependable, and she recognized their need for her. Heiki also visited the Pontila Youth Club, which was hosting a dance on the night of Pia's abduction. However, no one saw Pia that night, and even if she was there, odds are no one saw her, since the night ended in turmoil, with a fight. Heiki Ristikainkar went to the police on Monday morning when Pia failed to appear. He informed them that it was uncommon for Pia to be unable to contact him and that he was sure something terrible had occurred due to her complete absence. The police decided to conduct interviews with her classmates and friends. Pia had no adversaries and was regarded by her friends as quiet yet powerful. Because there was no evidence that she had been bullied or targeted in any manner, authorities determined that no one in Pia's circle of friends or relatives would wish to harm her. If she was abducted, it was most likely by someone she did not know. There were a number of sightings of Pia in Turku in the weeks after her disappearance. Police investigated and discovered a girl who had a striking likeness to Pia, concluding that she was the person seen about town. Heike was anxious to locate his daughter as winter approached. He had a hunch she had died, but he wanted investigators to locate her corpse before it vanished under the snow. Regrettably, the case of Pia Ristikainkar remains unresolved to this day. Thus, in 1995, all police could do was attempt to link her disappearance to a guy already in jail. Pia's hometown of Pikio was about 180 miles, 300 kilometers, south of Shainayoki. However, investigators discovered that Lepinen served his military duty in 1988 at Ninasalo, a town located just a two-hour drive from Pikio. While it was conceivable that he could have gone there, there was no way to prove it. Shainayoki police chose to focus on the two instances in which the victims had been found. 
Pia Kuru and Pia Toili's cases were examined concurrently. Is it possible that the same guy murdered both Pias? And who was this gentleman? Was he Harry Lepinen? Lepinen's Mazda was searched once again, this time for evidence connecting the car to Pia Toili. Pia was last spotted wearing a red woolen jacket. The jacket's fibers were discovered in Lepinen's vehicle. However, the jacket was nowhere to be seen. In turn, Mazda fibers matched those discovered on the Pia's body. The viscose fibers were very distinctive. Without a doubt, the fibers discovered on Pia came from Lepinen's vehicle. The snow was thawing after another brutal winter. Police discovered a campfire in Lepinen's garden. They quickly sent forensic experts to the scene to search for evidence of the Pia killings. They discovered a partially burned buckle that matched the one from Pia Toili's purse. Additionally, there were a variety of buttons and some burned leather fragments. Coincidentally, a transportation worker at Aura's Mala Station came forward and said that a girl knocked on her door in early October and asked if she might order a cab. The young lady wore just a leather vest and lacked an overcoat. The relatives of Pia Toili acknowledged that she wore a leather vest. She adored it and was most likely wearing it on the night she vanished. They discovered a photograph of Pia wearing the vest and noticed that the buttons on the vest matched those recovered in Lepinen's fire pit. The lady who needed a cab that night, however, was not Pia. Another lady identified herself as the individual at Aura's Mala Station. The leather vest was labeled New Basic. Since 1989, Finland has sold 1,600 pieces. Although the lady was not Pia, this side tale led investigators to Lepinen and bolstered their case. Until that moment, the attention had been all on Pia's crimson overcoat. Nobody considered what she was wearing under the jacket. Both Pias contributed to the inquiry in some manner. With the discovery of Pia Toili, considerable progress was made in the investigation of the Pia Kuru case. Due to the apparent similarities between the two crimes, the prosecution chose to prosecute Lepinen with both murders. Hari Lepinen's trial was scheduled for December 1995, after the completion of his psychiatric assessment. Lebanon was determined to be of sound mind and fit to stand trial after the examination. Psychologists unanimously concluded that he was emotionally indifferent and apathetic. All allegations of attempted indecent attacks against him presented an image of a deviant possessed of aggressive inclinations. His previous indecent assault victims described him as repulsive and aggressive. The trial began in January of the following year. At Lebanon's trial, his defense claimed that he was framed by authorities and accused law enforcement of planning the fiber evidence to convict their client. Additionally, it was known that Lepinen often left his keys in the ignition, which allowed anybody to steal his vehicle, perform the crime, and then return it. Additionally, they drew attention to the leather vest coincidence and accused police of fabricating evidence. According to the defense, the same individual who may have stolen Lepinen's vehicle returned it and subsequently burned the evidence in his fire pit. The court was informed by the then prosecutor about the traffic fine Lepinen got on the night of October 1, 1991. Harry Lepinen was the only one driving his own vehicle on the night of Pia Kuru's disappearance. Harry Lepinen was convicted of both murders on March 16, 1996, and sentenced to eight and a half years in prison for the murder of Pia Kuru and eight years and two months in prison for the murder of Pia Toili. The public and media expressed anger and called for a more severe punishment. In August 1996, the Court of Appeal heard Lebanon's case. He was condemned to a total of 20 years and six months in prison and ordered to compensate the relatives of tens of thousands of Marcus victims during this hearing. The Supreme Court rejected Lebanon's last appeal. Lebanon maintained his innocence throughout his imprisonment. He claimed the cops fabricated evidence against him in order to solve the case. The police reacted to his allegations by declaring them to be complete rubbish. However, when another young lady named Pia was killed in 1998, the public cast doubt on Lepinen's culpability for a brief time. However, her assassin was apprehended a month after her death, and authorities verified that the case had nothing to do with the Kuru or Toili crimes. Additionally, it occurred in January, not October, at a town about three and a half hours northwest of Shinaoki. The Pia killings became the subject of speculation on online forums and rumor mills. There were just too many parallels to think Lepinen did not pre-plan it. According to one tale, Lepinen's brother had a girlfriend named Pia in the early 1990s. Were the killings committed as a result of a crush on her? The forum conjecture continues to state that Lepinen's brother's girlfriend supported him, stating that he never made her feel uncomfortable or gave her any problem. Naturally, all of this is speculative. In April 2002, the Pia Risti Kainkar case took a fresh turn. A weird letter received at Karina Police 14 years after she was last seen. 
It was an eyewitness report of someone claiming to have driven about the Piquio region on October 7, 1988. According to the witness, he saw a guy dragging an unconscious female to a vehicle and loading her into the trunk. This occurred just after midnight. The letter included the vehicle's registration number. When police investigated, they discovered that the vehicle belonged to a well-known and decent assaulter in Turku, but there was insufficient evidence to determine whether or not the anonymous eyewitness story was genuine. The letter was signed Tom on Bors and did not provide any contact information. The sole indication was the letter's origin in Sweden. Police sought information from the public and utilized the media to encourage the anonymous writer to come forward. However, no more contact occurred. However, as a result of the increased attention, more witnesses came forward. In 2003, a retired fisherman called the police hotline to report an event that had plagued him for over a decade. He said that he observed a suspicious large boat in the sea near Piccio one day, around the time of Pia's disappearance. The boat seemed out of place, since it was designed for the open sea, and the bay at Piccio was rather small. He saw two guys tossing a big item into the sea from the boat. They were visibly frightened when they saw the old fisherman and fled as fast as could. However, even years later, authorities were unable to locate the boat or the two individuals mentioned by the fisherman. As tragic as the tale of Pia Rastikainkar's disappearance was, no solid proof connecting Harry Lepinen to the case has yet surfaced. The fact that it followed the pattern of the Pia murders was dismissed as coincidental. For the families of Pia Kuru and Pia Toili, their sad tales contained little justice. Harry Lepinen made his debut in 2004. And he returned to his father's warehouse, where he worked as a welder. He returned to the same town, kept his own identity, and went about his life as if nothing had occurred.